The king has returned. The prophecies fulfilled. The years of longing are over. The king has returned. And now all will be made right. Amidst shouts of praise and tears of joy, the pleading for justice, the cries for our enemies' defeat. The king has returned. The king who was driven from his land as an infant, who spent his first years as a refugee, who understands pain and suffering. But this king is not who we were looking for. This king brings justice not over our enemies, but in the midst of our enemies. He brings peace, not in our land, but in our souls. He is the answer to the prayer we did not know we were praying. The King has returned. Long live the King. The king is dead. The hand that once held a branch now gripped a hammer. The king is dead. This king of kings who embraced the very nature of a servant. This prince of peace broken for us. This commander of angels surrendered to a cross. This king joins us in our suffering, empathizes in our weakness, and he calls us to die with him, to lay down our lives, to live in surrender that we may be fully alive. The king is dead. Lo, live. This king is not gone forever. The story has not ended. There is a twist, a third act. There is a third day, and on that third day, the king will strip death of its power and extinguish the sting of Hades. This king is not defeated. This king is not destroyed. This king is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The king has returned, leaving death behind, destroying hate, inviting us all to live in his victory. His kingdom and his peace. Yes, the king has risen. Long live the king. This morning I want to talk about waving our praise. You came in this morning and there were branches and coats on the front steps like there were in Jesus' day because on that triumphal entry day, that first Palm Sunday, they cut off the branches of the palms, four different species, we only have one, and they waved them before the Lord, they threw them on the ground, they threw their coats on the ground, those things that they were using because it was a, a festival time, and the, they were coats that they would have been using as their blankets and their sleeping gear, yet they threw them on the ground for Jesus to ride over on a donkey, and while they declared him, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, Hosanna save us, O king, is what they said. Let me just read that passage to you from Matthew 21. It says, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. 
Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Kind of like outside this morning. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, or Hosanna, for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, praise God or Hosanna in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. And who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, this morning I want to talk about these things. The branches. The palm branches. Because... They weren't just there because they were available. They had symbolic purpose. You see, the palm branch was something that was focal in one of the feasts of Israel, and that was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Sukkot. That's not spelled S-U-C-K-I-T. It's spelled S-U-K-K-O-T, just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm saying when I say that. But in that feast, Israel would go and they would celebrate. They would make these little shelters and they would make shelters and they would cover them with palm branches, four different species of palm branches, and they would dwell in them for the period of the festival to recall and to remember when God had led them out of Egypt, had led them out of their bondage, and brought them to the promised land. And there was that time when they were in the wilderness and they were dwelling in tents rather than in homes. And every year, annually, they would celebrate this feast. And their houses would not only be covered with branches, but they would decorate with those branches inside of those shelters or those temples. They would also, at the beginning of them, make a processional and they would wave those branches in the air in praise to God for his salvation and for him bringing them out of the bondage that they were in Egypt. Now, if you go ahead and jump ahead to this point where we see Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem and they're waving the branches and they're crying out, save us, O King, or Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, we see once again a reiteration of a similar thought because Jesus came to set us free from bondage, amen? He came to save us, and even though on that day they might have been thinking that Jesus was coming to save them from Roman oppression, they were still crying out, but what they didn't realize is that their mouths were declaring something that was far greater, and that was the salvation of their souls. That was their deliverance from the bondages of sin and eternal death, because Jesus' work on the cross paid the price for our sin. And then his work when he went down into the grave and he took the keys of death and hell from the grave and then he resurrected showing he had power over death and the grave is why we can have eternal life and why we can live eternally. So when they were waving those branches, they were signifying his triumphal entry to be the victor. Amen? And praise is becoming of someone who's a victor. In fact, if you were a Gentile and from the Roman world that they were in, those palm branches would have been used when a general or an emperor was coming back into the city of Rome, and they would have been used to wave their branches in sign of his victory and his conquest over the enemy. So whether you were Jew or whether you were Gentile, these branches were part of a processional of praise and worship and honor to declare victory over the enemy. Only one person said amen, Rick. What's the deal, man? <laughs> to give you victory over the enemy. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Luke 19, 36 to 40 tells us that it's the same account of that triumphal entry, but there's a little note added on to Luke's account of it. You see, it says, as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him, and when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, 
All of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen through the person of Jesus. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in highest heaven. And this is the little thing that Luke adds into his account of the same event. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus said, he replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. You know, when will the church realize that if we don't shout out the praises and the miracles of God, when will we as a church realize that God has called us to proclaim his glory, his kingship, and his greatness? That if we fully know him as Savior, that we should be the ones declaring this King of kings and Lord of lords, and if we don't, the rocks will cry out because he wants our praise. And I want to talk about that praise this morning. Jesus wants our praise. Can you say that? Jesus wants my praise. Say it, my praise. Jesus wants my praise. How do you know God wants you to praise him? And we're all sometimes like, I'm so glad I grew up in a Pentecostal home where people weren't afraid to praise the Lord. I grew up in a church where people weren't afraid to proclaim their praises to God. We shouldn't be afraid. Don't tell me it's cultural. Don't, don't tell me it's a cultural thing. I, I, I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm from that, you know, that that's kind of staunch, quiet culture. And those people over there are from a more passionate culture. I know I'm Italian. I came from a passionate culture. But my mother's Welsh. I'm just as Welsh as I'm Italian. And the Welsh are kind of uptight like the English. Trust me, man. I spent spending eight days in England. They are uptight. <laughs> they're still walking around every day in suits and ties. I'm like, oh. and they're just kind of dowdy and like. Mm-hmm. There's oh, you know what? One of the best things on the whole trip that when we were in London was I gotta say this. We were walking by this one park. There was no building. There was a church beside it, but there's this one park, and it had a plaque because that's where Charles Wellesley used to preach, and that's where when when he would preach. There was, the, there was part of that, that, that revival that would come forward where, where people were swooning and, 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 and basically it was all the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And he didn't know what was going on. They just, people just get all emotional in these meetings because the power of God, it was really the power of God moving in the meetings. He was just preaching the word and just the spirit was moving. And they still had a plaque and they still every year go and have services in that park to, in commemoration of that, which I thought was awesome. God wants our praise. The Bible tells us that Jesus, that the Lord or God, inhabits the praises of the people of Israel, that he's enthroned in that praise. Something else about those shelters and that Feast of Tabernacles is that it talks about, you know, they dwelt in the tabernacle. Are you aware that you and I are the new tabernacle for God to dwell in? We are the temple for the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us. We are a habitation for his praise. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. When you give yourself to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you and you become a new tabernacle, a new shelter, a new temple, a temporary one. Because someday these, are going to, these bodies are going to be raised incorruptible, we're going to be made new, and we're going to be in the very physical presence of God in heaven. But until that time, his presence comes and lives in us. Amen? There's a reason to praise. Ephesians 2, 19, 22 speaks about the church. It says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, together, we are his house. Not the building. I know we're doing rentals on it, but you and I, we are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him your Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. You know, the spirit comes and dwells in his people, and how does he do that? He He dwells in the praises of his people. Psalm 22, 3 says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. We are a spiritual Israel, those of us who are redeemed and saved. The Lord is made king on the praises of his people. That means 
that whether we are alone as a temple of the Lord in our own prayer closet, or whether we have gathered together as the body of Christ, creating a house for the presence of the Spirit of God to dwell, that when we praise the Lord, we enthrone him as our king upon our praise. God wants our praise. He wants to be acknowledged as king of our lives, as king of our hearts. He wants his presence to dwell in us, and he wants to raise up as king over all in his church. Do you believe that today? He's come to live in us. So we don't need these palm branches every week. All we need is these. Amen. You know it kind of looks like a palm branch when you do that? Everybody put your hands up. Did God give you hands? He gave them to praise him. You know, if you look through the Psalms, you look through them, it talks about it talks about clapping those hands, waving those hands, lifting those hands. It's signs of surrender, it's signs of praise, it's signs of yielding, it's signs of declaring his glory. All of those different forms of praise, kneeling and crying and shouting and jumping and singing and playing instruments, all of these are forms of praise to declare that he is king. Amen. If we don't declare, who's going to? The Bible says if we don't declare his majesty that the rocks are going to cry out. I don't need a rock doing my business. Amen. Why? Because Jesus is worthy of our praise. Next one. (laughs) He's worthy of our praise. Do you know what that means? When you come to church or you're in your prayer closet at home, it's not about if you feel like praising him. We praise him because he's worthy. You know what? When, when a king would process down the road, it's not about, you didn't bow and turn to the king. When you came into a king's presence and you'd bow low, you didn't do that because you felt like it. You did it because you were in the presence of the king. Because he was considered worthy. Well, we serve the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is always worthy. Worthy. He is worthy of our praise. And you know, he's not just any king. You know, something that we have kind of, we don't really pay much attention to kings and, 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 and royalty and things in our world today. We look at that as something kind of, of, of the old ways of doing things. One of the other things that we enjoyed in London was we went on a parliament tour and we heard the whole history of the kings and the queens of England and how they lost their power, how they were kicked off the throne, and then how they brought them back. But really all they are is a, is, is a is a, a, a figurehead. They really don't bear any real governmental power. They, they let them give the final like wave of their wand or whatever and, and their, their scepter and kind of put their mm-hmm on it. But they don't make policy. They don't make law. They don't do any of that anymore. But a king, a king in days past was a leader of his people, not just, not just any leader, but he was involved actually in their lives. He was judge over his people. People came to him for judgment, to declare law, for different things. And when there was a war or they were at, enemy with the, if they were at war with an enemy, he didn't just send armies out to fight. A good king, a victorious king, a powerful king with the people, he led the armies out to battle. And the great kings, and if you look to the Bible, look at just David and Saul and all those. They didn't just send the armies out. They led the men to battle. They were there in the battle fighting with the people. And so when a king was worthy of honor, it's because they had brought his nation to victory over the enemy. There's no difference with Jesus. He's brought us to victory over the devil. He's brought us to victory, to triumph. We call it the Triumphal entry because it was preparing the way for what was about to happen. I know the people thought he was going to rise up and conquer the Romans. Instead, he went and he conquered sin and death. Much greater enemy of the people. Amen? And he brought victory. For that reason, he is worthy of our praise. Revelation 5, 12 says, And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. He's worthy. He is worthy. You know, we praise singers, and actors, and and, and sports players. We cheer and scream when they come out on the field. We praise political leaders who share the same opinion as us. And we boo the ones who don't. 
she have the same opinion as us. But we withhold praise from the only one has, who has given us victory over the grave and who has the power to grant eternal life. He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We need to praise the victor, not just today, but Every day, every time we come together as living stones and we are built in a habitation where he dwells, our praises need to enthrone the king. Amen? And then there's something else that happens when we do that. You see, Jesus wins through our praise. Now I want you to think about that. Jesus wins through our praise. Praise brings victory in the life of the believer. Have you ever seen the defeated believer? Life stinks. Everything's going wrong in my life. Nothing's working out. They're always depressed, always negative. Praise brings victory. Praise brings victory. You haven't defeat in your life? Start praising them. You see, the first thing praise does is it makes the devil flee. You need the devil to flee off the things in your life? Let me, let me read you a scripture in James chapter 4. You've heard me say it before. Let me do it again, though. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Uh, see, that's one of the reasons why we don't praise, because we don't want to wash our hands of our sin or purify our hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. How many know that he's coming for a bride who's without a spot or wrinkle? God wants us to separate from the things of this world. Amen? Let me go back to that verse, humble yourselves before God. Because he's talking about the devil fleeing. Okay. You know why a lot of people don't praise? If I raise my hands, what will people think? If I kneel down, what will people think? If I shout to the Lord, what will people think? We often, and it's not, and if it's if it's not about what other people might think, sometimes it's because we don't want to acknowledge to God that we have a need. Because this is a sign of surrender. When we lift our hands, it's a sign of saying, God, I can't, I need you. That's what the lifting of the hands is. It's a sign of surrender. And when we're praising him with our voices, we are audibly declaring he's king and not us of our lives. Well, we're really good at wanting to sit on the kingdom of our own hearts, aren't we? But when we praise, what we're doing is we're turning the tables, we're turning the situation around, we're turning us off, we're turning our control off, and we're surrendering to God, and we're doing that not just in our thoughts, but we're doing it with our voices, with our speech, with our actions, with our behavior, with our bodies, and we're letting everybody else know that we're humbling ourselves before the king. We're acknowledging his authority in our life, not our own authority over our life. And it says when you humble yourselves before God, what happens is at that point then, we're resisting the devil who wants to keep us in pride. What was the sin in the Garden of Eden? It's like the devil spoke to the pride of Eve's heart when he sat there and said, you'll be as smart as God. You Don't you want to be as good as God, smart as God, as knowledgeable as God? It was all about pride. We all like to think we know it all, don't we? But if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And sometimes, whether it's our depression, whether it's our bitterness, whether it's our anger, whether it's our sickness, or whether it's our, our attitude, whatever it is, we just need to come to that place of yielding to God, of praising the Lord, because that act of humbling ourselves really says, God, I'm letting go and I'm lifting you up, and it sends the devil fleeing in our lives. We need to not care what anybody else thinks of me. Someone once said, when they go low, we go high. When we go low, he goes high. Amen? As we exalt and lift up Jesus, we're drawing close to God. 
near to God so he can do what did James say? So he can draw near to us. The other thing praise does is it tears down walls. You got an obstacle in your life that needs to be torn down? You better start putting praise in your life. When Israel entered past the, 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 the River Jordan and they were going to take the first city in the promised land that God had declared for them, the city of Jericho, what was the obstacle in the way but a massive wall that surrounded the city? And it wasn't their might, it wasn't their cannons or their beams or their sticks or their personal strength. None of that is what broke down the wall. They marched around that city in silence every day for six days. And on the seventh day, they marched around seven times. And on the last time, they stopped. And what brought the city down was the shout of their praise to God. Joshua 6.20 says, When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could, and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. When there are obstacles to the promises of God in your life, when there are obstacles to victory in your life, you got to come and say, I'm going to praise the Lord. When it seems that nothing is going to break through, it's our praise that will bring down the walls that are holding us back from the victory God has intended for us. Praise breaks down walls. Well, I don't have any walls to break down. I'm doing good. Yeah, right. And even if you don't work community, right? It might not just be about you. It might be about somebody else's wall needs to come down. And your shout might help their wall to collapse. Why do we wait for other people to get excited when we come to church? Why don't we just get excited? Don't wait to see if, if, if you know, <laughs> I've been pastoring for 25 years. And there's always been those Sundays where, where it seems like those rare Sundays every now and then where the, the real good praising people are out of town or something or sick. And you're like, oh, they're really quiet in the church this morning. Why do we have to wait for the loud people? You be the loud person. You see, what happens is when we come in and we praise, the person next to us gets inspired to praise, and the person on the other side of them gets inspired to praise. And pretty soon we're all praising and declaring the victory, and it's a glorious presence of God in the house. But don't wait for somebody else to do it. Do I have to put rocks on every other chair to remind you? Draw a little smiley face on the rock. Say, if you don't praise, I'm going to praise. <laughs> Come on. The third thing praise does is it opens prison doors. I love the story of Paul and Silas. Let me read it. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. And all the doors immediately flew open. And the chains of every prisoner fell off. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. You want a bad moment in life? God brings you to a new land. Remember a couple weeks ago I talked about God redirecting paths? And, stuff, and, and this is the place where God redirected them. And all they did was speak to a girl who's demon-possessed and, and declare God's victory and set her free from the demon that was possessing her. And for that, they were arrested and thrown into jail. And you've heard me, some of you have heard me talk about this passage before, but I'm going to say it again. This was not just like our jails today. Our jails are like whew, resorts sometimes compared to what people used to go through in jail. We're talking, they were put in the inner dungeon. So it was dark, it was dank, there was no light of day. And I'm telling you, it was like dirt, dark, cold, damp floors. Think of every type of nasty bug, creepy crawly thing, rat infested. Nobody cleaned up after the previous prisoner. And if you're chained in place, we all know what happens after a few days. You just can't hold certain things anymore. It was nasty. And after they were beaten, they were chained in those places in that nastiness. And they weren't there. God hates me. How come God left me here? God abandoned me. God doesn't care about me. Is God alive? No, the Bible says they sang praise to God. 
It says that they were, while they were in chains, they were praying and praising and singing the hymns and declaring all the miraculous things God had done before. And an earth, the earth shook. The doors were open. Now, I can get the doors opening in an earthquake. I don't get the chains falling off. That was a supernatural miracle. But did they just fall off of Paul and Silas? They fell off of every prisoner. You see, we have a responsibility when we come into the house of the Lord as, a, as living stones. We have a responsibility to praise the Lord because you don't know that person who's coming in and chains that morning. You don't know the person who's bound and, and, and bound by sin in their life. You don't know the person who's bound by drugs, who's bound by a habit, or who's, who's bound in, in, in a negative situation or circumstance that they need freedom and deliverance from those chains that are holding them captive. And when you begin to praise God, it's not just your chains that fall off, but it's somebody else's too. Because praise breaks the chains. Why? Because we're declaring Jesus as our victor. The same Jesus who went to the cross and died and went down into the depths of the grave and conquered death and hell and took the keys back from death and released all those who were in prison in Hades who were in faith and then rose again so that those of us, when we die in Christ, we go to heaven. Jim lost his mom this, this week. She passed away. But the hope was she knew Jesus. In fact, she kind of kept on holding on, holding on, holding on. And, and as her minister came and ministered to her and went through things, and they sang the doxology. And when the doxology was done, which is praise God from whom all blessings flow, when the doxology was done, she went into heaven. She didn't have to go to the grave and hang out there for years until Jesus came and paid the price. She didn't have to be separated. She immediately went to be in the presence of her Savior. She immediately went into the presence of God and the throne room of God because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? And what brought her there? She went on the praise. I remember my father-in-law passed away. We were praising God as he was going. My own dad, when, when he passed away, we were singing praise to the Lord. And, and we ushered them into the throne of heaven where they're praising the King of Kings with praise down here on earth. And it created this connection place because it breaks every chain. So as those people on that first Palm Sunday waved their branches, there's a whole lot more going on than just branches flying in the air. It wasn't just because they were easy to pull off the trees. But they waved the branches, they laid them on the ground because they were declaring that this is a victorious Person, Jesus had not proclaimed his being the Messiah yet publicly. But on that day, he was publicly proclaimed as Messiah. He came as the triumphant Lord. He wants our praise. He's worthy of our praise. And he wins through our praise. So will we give him our praise? Amen. Stand with me.